Over time. Watts. Composer over with Nick Bird. Nick Bird is called Composer. Composer over time. Watts. Composer over time. With Andrew. Oh. Composer over Composer over Bird's Cup. Composer and I thought it was. Welcome to Composer Overtime. My name is Andrew Watts. And I'm Nick Verzi. Composer Overtime is a series of interviews featuring discussions and works by innovative composers across the world today. Nick and I are both composers and doctoral candidates at Stanford University, and will be facilitating these chats each week, sometimes with Bay Area guests, and sometimes on location across the U.S. and internationally. During each episode, we will hear a new perspective on the contemporary music landscape, find out about the composer's creative process and musical background, as well as listen to some of their recent work. This week, our guest is Brian Bombush an American composer living in Alameda, California. Brian has lectured on composition and world music at the University of Maryland, the Smithsonian Institution, CalArts, Union College, Holy Cross, Bard College, Mills College, University of Nevada, Reno, and the Escuela TAI of Madrid. He has additionally presented electronic music performances and lectures at UCSD, UCSB, Cal Arts, University of Nevada, Reno, and Mills College. Brian began his university education at Bard College, where he studied microtonal composition with Kyle Gann, and later received his master's in composition from Mills College, where he studied with Chris Brown, Fred Frith, Roscoe Mitchell, and Zena Parkins. From 2016 to 18, he taught composition, music theory, and music history on the faculty at Santa Clara University, where he also directed the Balinese Gamelan Ensemble. Since 2014, Bombush has directed the UC Santa Cruz Balinese Gamelan Ensemble, where he continues to teach while pursuing his DMA. It was a highly fruitful interview that will be broadcast in two parts and also available online unbroken. Welcome, Brian. Thank you. It's good to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. Thanks. So, um, how long have you been in the Bay Area? I moved out here in January of 2012. Uh, So, what is that now? Seven years, I guess? A little more than seven years. Um, Yeah, I moved out here from the East Coast uh, to do my master's at Mills. And I started right then, kind of in an off semester, in this, like, the second semester of the academic year. Uh, yeah, and then I moved down to Santa Cruz 2014, I think, and then moved back up to the Bay Area at the beginning of last year, so 2018. And both Mills and Santa Cruz were for composition? Correct. And yep. were, were you doing composition things on the East Coast too? Yes, yeah, sort of. I So I did my undergrad at Bard College, and I uh, was studying composition there, but I, I kind of went back and forth between a bunch of different th- interests at Bard, uh, in part because of the way just the the chronology of my time there worked out. So I, I kind of was drawn there by Kyle Gann, who's a big mm. scholar in microtonality, and, and I was really interested in that going in to Bard. Uh, but I was also really interested in Balinese music, and they, they had a, a pretty active Balinese gamelan ensemble that was connected to the Gamelan Ensemble in New York City, which is uh, Gamelan Dharmaswara. So I was kind of active in both of those worlds, but at, uh, Kyle went on sabbatical for an extended time while I was there. And then there was kind of um, a scandal that happened within the Gamelan community that where they broke ties, the school broke ties with the Balinese guy who had been teaching there. So both of those things kind of dissipated for me in my time there. And I ended up 
focusing almost exclusively on Argentinian folk music for like my last couple of years there. Um, so yeah, that undergrad was a weird, it was like mm. a weird time for me. And then I, I went back into really composing a lot of music um, upon graduating, trying to do some projects involving gamelan and string quartet. Uh, but before that, I went to the Interlochen Arts Academy for high school. And so I studied composition mm. at kind of through this the end of Michigan. my time there in Northern Michigan. Yeah. yeah. Right. Was um, George Santakis at He was Bard? at Bard. And yeah. uh, Joan Tower? Both of them. Right. Yep. Okay. Did you have much contact with them? I, I not, I mean, very peripherally, I, I'd say Joan in the beginning. So I, I actually, I had, I had come right out of Interlochen and, and I started Interlochen studying classical guitar, but kind of switched to composition at my at the end of my time there um, and was doing some of it on my own because I wasn't fully embraced by the composition department at Interlochen. And so I ended up spending my last semester of Bard living in Spain and studying with a composer there, Jose Luis Merlin, who's kind of pretty well known in the classical guitar community, but not too well known outside of that. So then when I went to Bard, um, they had just started the conservatory program there, like a double degree program. And so I, I hadn't applied for that in the beginning because um, I think it didn't even, so I deferred a year after I got into Bard. So I went, I ended up going a year after I applied. And I think that was the year they started that program. Mm -hmm. In any case, I decided that I kind of would be interested in getting a conservatory degree, but Joan didn't like think that I was good enough or something. <laughs> she didn't, she didn't <laughs> let me into that program. And I think it was also that she saw that I was really interested in working with Kyle. Like that was my main focus. And they also didn't embrace him. He wasn't, a faculty on the conservatory part of Bard. He was sort of like relegated to just the music department. Mm -hmm. So and it was factions within the yeah, university. Very yeah. Factions. I mean, it, it all worked out great and I'm happy that everything happened the way it did. But ultimately what it meant was a lot of the stuff that I did as a composer, like when I was at Bard and especially after graduating was all very much just like my own trial and error. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't really have many formal composition teachers like Kyle was the most formal one that I had at that time in my sort of development as a composer and we pretty much just like drank scotch in our <laughs> lessons and you know listened to like Julius Eastman and stuff which turned out to be extremely that sounds great you know yeah, yeah it was it was they were very you're getting uh, all sorts of different educations right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> the essentials, right, right. right. Yeah. but I came in wanting to like I was just so into tuning theory because uh, having gone to Interlochen and had a pretty rigorous like theory training and traditional theory like when I was 17 or 18 I started to learn about just intonation and these other sort of uh, avenues you might say of music theory you know I, I sort of took on the whole sort of Harry parts like oh everything's a lie and you know I kind of got on a high horse for a little and so I, I thought Kyle was like, oh, maybe I can now go study music theory with the same rigorous approach that I had to do at Interlochen. But, you know, with Kyle and that, I'll be doing ear training, learning how to like distinguish between a syntonic major third and, a you know, um, like a Pythagorean third or something like that. Uh, but Kyle had no interest in doing like a regimented yeah, like, ear training or anything. He so. would just prefer to drink scotch. Like, no, 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 no. Let's just listen to a lot of music yeah. and enjoy just it. pontificate. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I knew a lot of people in my undergrad who had um, gone through interlocking. Uh -huh. uh, I was Me wondering, too. yeah, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that experience. Sure. It's, it's, from what I understand, pretty unique. Yeah, I mean, it was definitely a life-changing um experience for me i uh well i went to the high school a lot of people don't know that it actually has a high school they just they think of it and they think of the summer camp because the summer camp is first of all it's much bigger it's like five times the student body of the high school in part because it's not just limited to high school age it's all ages um and it was started i think 30 or 40 years before they started the high school. Uh, but in any case, I never went to, high school, the, to the summer camp. I just went to the high school. And I, I was coming out of, you know, I think leading up to that point. So I started there my sophomore year of high school. And in my freshman year of high school, I was in public high school in Northern Virginia. And I was like, I was on the basketball team and the football team. And, you know, I, I was, I, I could have very easily just been a jock. Um, <laughs> but I, I think, you know, I started... Well, yeah, 
I don't know if I'm going too far back here, but no, no, um, yeah. I, uh, I, I dislocated my shoulder during basketball season. And so I couldn't play and I ended up smoking weed, uh, like getting introduced to smoking weed and that, and I had always had a lot of musical talent and, and interest, but it was never like the thing that was cool, you know? Yeah. And then I, you know, it, it became the thing that was cool for me in my life. Mm -hmm. And then I had some pretty important music teachers at that age that were encouraging me. They were saying, oh, I think you have something you should go pursue that. And one of those teachers recommended interlock and looking into interlock. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I went there and it was like my life was totally different. All of a sudden sports were totally not cool. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know, being into like whatever your own individual weird, unique art thing was, was the cool thing. It was like this was like the early days of hipsterdom. So what <laughs> that wasn't like a codified thing. But those kids were all that, you I mean, were that way was, ahead of the curve. It was kind of yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I don't know if I was I was like the still the kind of jockey guy at interlock. Mm -hmm. um, well, you were like the jockey guy who like played the guitar. <laughs> yeah, and, like, exactly. Wrote microtonal music or yeah well microtonal music came a little later i think i was aspiring to be cooler <laughs> I with, see, yeah. in, in garnering that interest um well were you still um at this point were you mainly a guitarist or were you yeah. were you composing at this time yeah so i was i went so i actually applied to interlock in for voice a like classical voice oh really yeah. and and guitar and at the time i didn't have any formal training in guitar but i did have some in singing mm -hmm. it was actually my voice teacher who had recommended that i go to interlocking so i applied for both i didn't get into the voice program but i got into the guitar program so but i had never studied classical guitar at that point so I, that was when i was about 15 my teacher at interlocking put me on a really strict, you know, regimen of studying and learning classical guitar. Um, and then I think that was what, ult you know, I'd written some like just random like rock songs and stuff like that before that was, then. That was my next question because, yeah. you know, Andrew yeah. and I are actually both guitarists as well. Uh, yep. yeah. and, you know, it <laughs> seems like we've all kind of just somehow managed to get to this point. Yeah. You know, from yeah. Where we started. I, I feel like the guitar is to composers of our generation as the piano was to composers like sure. in the late 1800s. Definitely. Where but it's the just weird a thing, common... But it's weird in the way that, like, you know, let's say, like, a classical composer who's a piano player, they'll, like, take their... The, the piano becomes the feature of their compositions, whereas for a lot of guitarists, it ends yes. up being... You started off as a rock guitarist, and then you realized you couldn't study that in college, so you <laughs> picked up either jazz or classical... <laughs> And then you decided that you hated it yes. because it kills the passion for the <laughs> instrument. And then you're like, well, I was writing music anyway. I'm just going to continue doing that. And guitar is in there somewhere. That's a know? really, I think that's a really good breakdown. I mean, I'm definitely in the camp of people who I never want to pick up a guitar again. In my life, you know? <laughs> yeah. um, and, and I think some of it, oh, I don't know. Yeah, it was just because I, kind of what you said, like I got pushed into all these different directions that didn't just happen naturally. And, you know, I, I would say I really liked studying the classical guitar when I was 15. Um, and it was way harder than anything I'd been asked to do. And it really pushed me. But then by the time I was in my early 20s, I just thought oh, that's a really weird, like the classical guitar community can be really insular and mm -hmm. just kind of a bizarre world. And mm -hmm. what my musical interests were sort of expanded beyond what would, what that community had to offer. Mm -hmm. and, and and then I just started to like have all these holdups of just like the the underlying pain of what it was like to have to study guitar and practice four hours a day in like you know this militaristic classical mm -hmm. art school <laughs> in high school and so it just wasn't fun for me anymore mm -hmm. but yeah I th it's really interesting it's like what you said the piano has been versatile to a lot of people over a long period of time whereas the guitar although it's really versatile like it gets pigeonholed into these various identities that yeah. are they can be hard to break out of sure. i well, think yeah especially the, the electric guitar you know yeah. it's like yeah. you could i mean even just like a dreadnought acoustic too it's just like everyone knows what you're probably going to want to play yeah and if you do anything different it's seen as like a cultural statement or something yeah, like that right. as opposed to That's, like yeah it's a cool sound it's a really like good point sound. the cult yeah i mean because i just just briefly, uh, you know, I mentioned I have a, a lot of background in, in, in Indonesian music, you know, so I, I, I think a lot about the cultural statements involved there and especially with respect to using those instruments. But it's really good to keep in mind that, you know, instruments that are really common in the West, even the piano, but the guitar too, have just as many uh, deep and, and complicated cultural 
baggage that they bring to the table when you're using those instruments in, in certain contexts, especially as a composer. Um, yeah, we just are, you know, we're familiar with them to different degrees, right? Yeah. Like, if it's in a culture that which is outside our own, or even if it's just like, I obviously know more about the history of the guitar than I know about the history of like, I don't know, the flute or something. Sure. Because you know, like, I play it. And right. That's, yeah, that just gives you greater insight. Sure. Right, right. Are there elements that you can point to during this period at Interlochen or maybe as an undergrad that you feel are still present in your music today? Yeah. I think I... Um, so I, I was really interested in like just the string quartet as, a, as an ensemble, like as a, as a mode of communication mm. starting at that age. Um, like I think that one of the first, the, the first like let's say Western classical music canon type uh, repertoire that I got into at the age of being an impressionable. So like let's say when I was 14 or something was uh, like impressionist piano music, WC. And then I, I, maybe that led me into hearing Ravel string quartet or something. And that, oh, yeah. that just piece. got me thinking about music in a different sort of a way where it was like something that's both extremely intimate, but ext but very versatile and can be really big at times, like in terms of the types of um, sounds and expressions that are being communicated. And so, so when I was at Interlock and, you know, having written some like little ditties for guitar <laughs> before <laughs> the first thing that I started to write as a composer was a string quartet and that was because I you know I had, I had a lot of friends then who played string instruments for the first time in my life who were really good like world-class good <laughs> and I and I was watching them play a lot and I just you know it seemed like a thing that I could do you know um, and I had all of a sudden the tools of knowing how to do it and like computers that had software where I could go and they helped me do it all that stuff mm -hmm. and so so I that was like the first thing that I ever wrote was for string quartet when I was about 15 and still to this day that's like one of the things that I continue to write and go to and my interest in writing music is more for string quartet mm -hmm. um, but again it had to do with you know being exposed to it at that age and seeing it as something you know, not just because when you're growing up, like I grew up in the suburbs, you know, and you're growing up in the suburbs and you're listening to the radio, like a string quartet is just such a distant reality. You know, it's like there's no part of it that you can actually like grasp. You know, it just seems like something from a different time, a different place. But then, you know, all of a sudden being in a group of kids and they're all playing that music and I'm watching them and they're my friends. It was just it made it, you know, it gave it a, a personalization for me. You know, and it made me feel willing to approach it in my own creative outlet, I guess.
Well, you've worked in the past also, I think, on a few different projects with the Jack Quartet. Is yeah. That right. Yep. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and how how uh, working with them has um, developed your thinking about writing for the string quartet? Yeah. Sure. Um, well, they were the first. The f- well, I shouldn't. Say, there was there was one group that had played string quartets that I had written prior to that. One real group. And then there was like a a makeshift group that had happened in Spain when I was living there as a, as a teenager. But um, but the Jack Quartet, um, they sort of picked up a project that I had been trying to get off the ground for a little while. Um, and I, so I, so I had present, I had this idea to arrange some like traditional Balinese gamelan pieces for string quartet and then to program them alongside of pieces that I wanted to write either just for string quartet, but using certain like Balinese compositional methods in order to have those pieces choreographed for Balinese dance. And then um, a piece for like that combined gamelan instruments and string quartet. And some of that came from, like I said, at that point, what was already a really deep interest in tuning theory where I was just, you know, there's very complicated things going on in Balinese tuning models and so I wanted to and I had written some like just intonation stuff for string quartet before that so I wanted to find ways of combining those worlds um so I pitched the project to the Kronos Quartet actually because I knew Terry Riley through Kyle Gann and he put me in touch with David Harrington um and they were actually they were really uh, supportive of me I mean they didn't end up taking on the project but like I flew out to San Francisco to meet with David Harrington. Um, they talked through a lot of details of what, you know, what the project would entail. Um, for whatever reason, it, you know, it didn't didn't come to fruition, but David gave me a really nice letter of recommendation at that point. Um, and then it was sort of through all of that work that I put in presenting it to Kronos that I was able to easily just sort of pitch it to the Jack Quartet. And that was at a time when, like, they had a good reputation, but they weren't quite on the stage that they are now. Mm -hmm. So, like, I think I met them at a Bang on a Can marathon in New York. And this is for sure before the the switch of members. Yep. Oh, yeah. This was 2011. Sure. Um, Went well before then. Yeah. And so they... uh, you know, they were receptive to like some, I think what I was 22 at that time or something, this 22 year old just walking up to them and saying, hey, I've got this project, like maybe you can go to Bali and do you want, do you want to be in? <laughs> and they were like, yeah, that sounds great. That does sound awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so that, uh, that was sort of like the first opportunity that I had to write for musicians who I knew were fantastic and who, you know, who would be willing to try out different sort of unique ideas that I wanted to bring to the table. Um, so, yeah, and they were they were fantastic. So, yeah, we did a we went to Bali together in 2012. And so they yeah, they played a couple pieces that I had arranged Balinese pieces arranged for string quartet that ended up incorporating a few gamelan instruments like like drums and stuff that made it so it was easy for dancers to to dance to. Uh, and then I wrote a piece just for them that didn't end up getting choreographed, but it was meant to be kind of like a Balinese dance piece for a string quartet. And then I wrote a, kind of a bigger piece that was uh, gamelan and string quartet. And we performed it on what was just one of the crazier performances for me that it was a, um, in the Bali Arts Festival, but that takes place, so it's in Denpasar, which is the capital of Bali, and it takes place at, uh, like at a big temple. Uh, and the audience is like three or 4,000 people. And they're extremely wow. <laughs> rowdy. You know, nice. <laughs> like booing, and they'll throw things and they'll laugh at the dancers if they make mistakes. Um, and so, uh, <laughs> Brutal. <laughs> yeah, no, but it's yeah, it's, it's all great. in fun, and like yeah. it's sort of like it was. Um, yeah, I mean, I kind of almost see it the way, not quite, but similar to closer to the way that we might think of sporting events, like that type of a uh, arts presentation in Bali. Because first of all, so many people are interested. You know, like it, it's and they're passionate about it and they're all very engaged with it. Um, and it's not, you know, there aren't all of necessarily these hang ups that we might have when we go to performance like, oh, when am I supposed to clap or when, you know, all these different things that we've been told. There's not really as much of that, or at least in the in the circumstance that I was in where it was like, although it was in a temple, it was not religious music. You know, it was like. Um, let's say secular music. Mm-hmm. So the kind of all bets are off and people people are going 
it's just a wild scene. So, um, so yeah, that was a great experience for me. <laughs> yeah, it sounds great. I'm curious, what about the, the string quartet do you think lends itself nicely to integration with gondolon music? Mm. Uh, I mean, I almost want to answer that by saying, <laughs> like, there are so many things that don't work. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Between sure the two so. that that's almost what makes it interesting as a composer is yeah. finding ways to work with either the things that don't work and use that to your advantage um, or finding like the one solution mm -hmm. and then that creates all the limitations that allows one to like mm -hmm. write a piece or something, you know? Yeah, because like um, imagine if you were just like doing the same thing with percussion, let's say. Right. It could be very easy to just like, Im you know, imitate the style sure. instead of just like, well, you know, I have to come up right. with a creative solution. Yeah, and that's, yeah, the kind of the imitative style like that was something that I was interested in early on, which was, oh, what it would what would it sound like for these sort of gamelan pieces? Like, for example, an interlocking melody to be played on two violins. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, that might sound really cool. Turns out, it doesn't sound that cool. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, or it's just you know, it the effect is was, totally yeah. different. Yeah, because because of the nature of the attack of stringed instruments and the paired tuning that you have in a gamelan, that it's different. Um, but. Uh, um, I would say like the number one thing that stands out in my mind of, you know, blending something like a string quartet with a gamelan is just the nature of sustain of, of stringed instruments versus what you get in a gamelan ensemble. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are instruments that are using gamelan ensembles like the bamboo flute, the suling or the rabab, which is like a bowed instruments that. Uh, can play important parts and pieces, but are often sort of like auxiliary instruments that sit on top. But for the most part, a gamelan ensemble is all percussive instruments that have differing levels of just attack and decay. Um, and to have all of a sudden instruments that can like do the reverse of that, where they start from nothing and get loud, it's just a totally different type of soundscape. So blending things like that is is something that I came to become really interested in and how, you know, working with uh, essentially two completely different sound worlds. I would say the other, the other big thing um, has to do with the spectrum of the two types of instruments, you know, whereas a string instrument is, uh, has very high levels of harmonicity, right? If you bow an open string, you're going to hear a near perfect harmonic spectrum with all of, you know, these intervallic overtones that, correlate to the harmonic series but when you play a gamelan key um like a you know a bronze bar it's going to produce overtones that are completely inharmonic right mm -hmm. like the for example um i'm going to get a little <laughs> technical here but, it, yeah. um uh so you know if you if you play if you're bowing a string or you pluck a guitar string the fundamental frequency um it, the, the first overtone would be called the second harmonic, right? And that's going to have twice the frequency because it's exactly half of the string length that's vibrating to produce that harmonic. But when you play a gamelan bar, the fundamental frequency, and this is where radio is, fails a little bit, but if you could imagine it vibrating along the transverse sort of length of the bar, um, it sort of the bar pumps down and up at its center and down and up at its edges and it has a nodal point at about two ninths from the edge. So if you can imagine like a vibraphone bar or a marimba bar that's suspended at this nodal point, right? That's the fundamental frequency. But the first overtone, which I'm using the word overtone specifically in order to not use the word harmonic because you couldn't call it a harmonic in this case, would be an, a secondary mode of vibration that's occurring across that transverse axis. And in an ideal bar, the frequency relationship to the fundamental would be like 2.76 or something. So not two or three or four or some harmonic thing, but some weird interval. And then as you keep looking up at spectrum, you get you know you, all of these really weird overtones. And so that really informs the soundscape of that instrumentation. And in fact, there's a really interesting theory by William Satharis, who, who wrote a book called Tuning, Timbre, Spectrum, Scale, in which he essentially posits that um, some of the unique modes let's, or scales, let's say, that are used in gamelan tunings might come from the fact that the, the keys have these really 
strange overtones. So you you might get intervals in higher pitched keys that are tuned to sort of inharmonic overtones in lower pitched keys. Mm. Uh, so that was something that I got really interested in. Um, you know, right around the time when I was starting to go to Mill. So after I did this project with the Jack Quartet, um, just starting to open my ears more to that sound world and find ways that it like it blends or doesn't blend with a harmonic sound world, which is really what most Western music is, you yeah. know, wind instruments, string instruments. Awesome. I think now would be a, a great time to listen to some music. Sure. Uh, yeah, do you want to tell us a little bit about your first piece? Sure. So I think uh, the piece that I'd love to share would be uh, the piece that I wrote for the Jack Quartet and a set of gamelan instruments that I built. Um, so this is not the piece, the first piece that I wrote for them um, where that we went to Bali, but it was the, the second project that I did with them. So it was about three years later, so 2015. And I had built a set of instruments uh, that were all steel metallophones um, in the higher register and then in the lower register, um, cedar keyed xylophones. I'm just going to clarify that term now, which is just because a lot of people use it in different ways. Xylo is, is Greek for wood. So for from a sort of a... Um, uh, an acoustician standpoint, a xylophone is anything that has, is a wooden keyed instrument uh, versus a marimba is like a very specific instrument. Uh, xylophone, even though it is a specific orchestral instrument, I like to use just f as a general term for anything with wooden keys versus in gamelan, um, oftentimes you have metallophones, right? So in any case, I built this set of instrument that's mixing xylophones in the low register with metallophones in the high register, and I tuned the scale of various intervals to, as I was explaining for these really uh, unpredictable inharmonic partials in lower keys. So I generated this really unique pentatonic scale and then created this complex beating relationship where there's a lot of difference tones created between the metallophones and the xylophones. And then essentially blended it, so specifically in the first movement, blended it with just open natural harmonics on the string quartet. So the, the idea there really being like, let's really spotlight the soundscape of an inharmonic spectrum with a fully harmonic spectrum and find ways that they can combine interestingly. Um, and then uh, the piece went on to sort of explore various temporal evolutions. So in the first movement, there's uh, these four tempo streams that are departing in different ways. Um, so the ensemble's falling click tracks uh, and the, these various polyrhythms are sort of coming in and out of uh, resolution as varying accelerandos and retardandos happen. And then in the last movement, um, the ensemble is doing essentially like a large scale five over seven over eight over nine polyrhythm. And it's one iteration of that polyrhythm. Uh, so I think that would be the movement that I would share the third movement. All right, well, let's take a listen. Thank 
So I was wondering if you could uh, explain a little bit about your compositional process, uh, maybe e even in relation to this work or uh, taking this work as kind of a jumping off point and how this relates to other works that you've composed. Well, I would say there's one thing that, so a lot of it for me when I'm wanting, like why I want to write music at all um, is just like kind of scratching an itch. So a lot of times like maybe I have certain sound that I want to hear and I in order to hear that I feel like I have to do it or I want to like have fun with a particular group of people in order to bring them together I have to write the music for that or something like that um, but there's another side of it that has nothing to do specifically with like putting the notes on the page but which is like the instrument building motivation um, where for example um, as I was explaining before, this idea of wanting to tune metallophones to a certain theory of how uh, like a gamelan tuning might have come out, like what William Satharis mentioned, um, instead of like getting some Balinese instruments that would number one, be extremely expensive, and number two, have all of these cultural, all of this cultural baggage associated with them, um, I, I found oftentimes that it was just easier and more enjoyable for me to just start from scratch and build my own instruments. So um, so that was sort of the, the first step in writing it. Like that piece and pieces like that was um, having a, a tuning idea in my mind, which translated to sort of a, an acoustic idea, uh, maybe not so much of a compositional idea in the sense of 
rhythm or melody or harmony, um, but just sort of a general soundscape. And then building the the mechanism for creating that soundscape and then starting to explore what that mechanism like what powers it possesses mm -hmm. um so so yeah so for that piece i i had built the instruments previously and that, i didn't build those instruments specifically for that piece i built them for a different piece but that was i think maybe the third piece i had written for them but the first kind of longer piece where I really felt like I could explore them and I had knew the instruments at that point having played a couple other pieces on them. Um, well having having made these instruments um, there's this, there's an interesting like chicken or the egg yeah. you know element to the theory that you brought up before. Uh, did you compose did you uh, create the instruments and then derive scales or, or modes th that came from uh, the overtones which which those instruments produced or were yeah. you more crafting the instruments around that soundscape that you had originally in mind um so i yeah i made the instruments first i designed let's say their spectrum their spectral properties to a certain extent that i was able to so mm -hmm. certain things i had control over and other things that i didn't uh, which is to say like there were certain partials or or overtones that um aligned with things that I had designed in the tuning and then other things that resulted out of it. Uh, so then when I started writing that piece in particular, one of the first things I did was to just analyze what I had, right? So, so in other words, analyze the things that I didn't have control over and see what properties they had. So I had pretty extensive charts that gave me a lot of different frequency information of, okay, these instruments have these overtones and those have those and um, ways in which they combined and maybe stacked harmonies that they created all on their own. Um, and then I think I started to build some chords there with um, first just natural harmonics produced by the strings. So the, the first move in that piece, um, it's really sort of exploring these these I, I now want to use the term harmonic in like the Western classical music theory sense, which is say like vertical fundamental frequencies related as a chord. Um, you know, finding ways that I could build, uh, you know, combine, let's say that now the acoustically harmonic spectrum with the sort of acoustically inharmonic spectrum. Do you feel like uh, instrument building is more of a West Coast trend? Uh, I, I say this sure. because... Since I've been uh, in the Bay Area, I've done some instrument building or augmented instruments in my own composition. Yeah. I've been to the Bay Area Maker Fair um, at a lot of the electronic and computer music institutes associated with the various universities in right. California. You can definitely see that as like a very active practice that a lot of composers have. Um, there's, of course, the Parch instruments. That's yep. a very California thing. But, Although, aren't they at uh, Montclair State University now, I think? True, are, but yeah. in terms of like their, sure. their development. Yeah. I saw them there, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it may be just my perception. Yeah. Even though I grew up on the East Coast and did my undergrad there, maybe because I wasn't doing that there, I wasn't noticing it. Sure. No, but you're, there's something to it, though. It, it also could just be the fact that you and I have been in California for five years. So, like, whatever is kind of continuing on the East Coast, it could be... Hmm something happening in parallel but at least for me i've definitely noticed that like there is an engineering mind out yeah. here that hmm. typically i don't really see it with acoustic instruments i see it more with like um again kind of extending instruments uh using True. sensors and or building electronic instruments entirely but yeah I have on the west coast it. On the West Coast, for sure. Yeah. But I haven't seen so much like acoustic instrument building in the same way. Hmm. Uh, well, let me just ask, Andrew, what, where did you go to undergrad? You the New England Conservatory oh, okay. in Boston. Um, so, yeah, my, I'm glad you asked that question because it actually came up recently. I was um, talking with Sarah Cahill and Paul Drescher, and that, um, that kind of that same question came up. And Paul had plenty to say. I mean, because he's just he's been around here forever and very involved in the instrument building community. Um, but my percep my perception of it is unique in that one. Um, yeah, I was I was on the East Coast kind of doing stuff before I came out here, so I I did run into certain things going on out there. Um, but number two, those things 
that I experienced there. And most of what I've done out here is very related to gamelan music. Um, so, you know, there's a, there is a big kind of community of people who have built gamelan instruments, like, um, you know, that's such that there's even a term called American gamelan <laughs> really? kind of that revolves around yeah. mm. that. Like Lou Harrison, for example, sure. is one of the big, big people who is, you know, that term gets thrown at a lot. But, um, but I would say, um, I think it's not, that's not fair a little bit to the people on the East Coast. So let's say just specific to the Gamelan community. Um, uh, there's several groups in the East Coast that had built Gamelan instruments really early on. So one of the groups is Gamelan Son of Lion. Um, and, they, and they're still active in doing like kind of experimental percussion and Gamelan music. Um, I think the, another group is the Evergreen Club. Um, and yeah, there's, there's a, a lot of other groups that aren't on many people's radar, but who have been doing a lot of interesting things for, for a long period of time. Um, with respect to specific thing you said, Nick, about, um, electronic instruments. So actually the first, um, the first piece that I ever wrote for, like, let's say something that was a gamelan that wasn't a traditional gamelan was for, a, a fully electronic like MIDI controller oh, yeah. gamelan set that was at MIT. Mm -hmm. um, and that was re a really involved process behind how th them building those instruments. Um, so I would say as much as I do agree with what you said in, in that, in, and in part, cause I've now been out here for seven years and I've just, I know a lot of the people who are doing it out here. I don't, I wouldn't be willing to say that it's more of a West coast thing. Um, just be, because I don't, I, I'm willing to accept that there's probably a lot going on the East Coast that I don't know about, you know, and especially stuff that's cropped up in the last five years. Um, that being said, I don't want to be anywhere but here. <laughs> I'm not willing to go to the East Coast mm -hmm. because there's nothing there that's like some scene that I know about that seems really vibrant that I want to go get involved in, you know, per se. Um, I mean, there's there is certainly a legacy out here. Mm -hmm. um, even if you're just looking at you know, people like Harry Parch and Lou Harrison, um, you know, there's there's a big West Coast sort of vibe around their canon of works and all the stuff that they built. Um, so going back to the process. Yeah. You build these instruments. Sure. You have some notion while you're building about pitches or, yes. you know, uh, constraints from the, the pitch domain and also, of course, the techniques required to play them. Right. So there's the the different performative um, constraints. Are you then, after they're built, doing like pen and paper? Are you doing recordings? Yeah. Improvising on these instruments first and transcribing parts? Sure. Um, let me just add, I want to, in response to your question, I just want to add one other thing I thought that, that is related about, but about the instrument building thing, yeah. the West Coast thing, which is that uh, in my experience, like having built a lot of instruments out here, the weather is actually a big factor so like i've built a number of instruments in the winter and i'm working outside a lot and that's something that would be really hard to do on the east coast like yeah, i just have to have to have a different infrastructure infrastructure altogether in order to make projects move forward uh, but but to being a place where the climate is so temperate you know you don't need to have like a really nice workshop or something to build instruments you can just do it year-round outside you know um but in any case so getting back to the thing that you just asked um the so i it, so with respect to the piece that we just heard um i spent a lot of time just like thinking about abstract concepts before putting any notes on the page as it were and even the that piece is a little over 30 minutes and the first half of it um is the, which is the first movement so it's about 15 minutes uh, i don't think i ever really put notes on the page like i was able to come up with a piece all through realizing these abstract ideas and then modeling them in different ways mm -hmm. i mean ultimately i did put some notes on the page for the string quartet <laughs> to look at sure. but really it's something that i almost could have just explained it to them um but so the other the other side of it for me and especially in that piece so i was i talked a lot about pitch material and let's say harmonic material but the other side of it for that piece was just think about time or rhythm temporal material whatever you want to call it um and i got i was really interested in exploring ideas of let's say 
let's call them multiple simultaneous tempo functions. So, you know, the most simple of which would be, you know, some extended polyrhythm that occurs. Uh, the most complicated that I can think of is where you have lots of different tempo streams that are speeding up and slowing down all at the same time and interacting in certain ways. Um, so that, that was something that, you know, I, I knew about, you know, and I, I end up learning a lot more about it the more I looked at Kanla Nankaro's work. But Nankaro was one of the first people who made me think about the possibility of that, you know, incorporating that into music. Uh, even people like Ives, you know, where he'll, he'll write for one ensemble, and then all of a sudden there's this other ensemble that just like occurs in the time, and they're not related in time, but they do end up being related vertically in terms of harmonies, sure. resultant harmonies. But um, so I, um, I, I started sketching out essentially tempo maps and I made a bunch of different tempo maps and then found different ways of modeling them like using software and sometimes incorporating samples that I had taken of my set of instruments and, or, and string samples and just sort of like building soundscapes and then realizing things that I liked or didn't like in terms of just tempo progressions. Um, and uh, and then ultimately coming up with something that I liked. So and I, I would say another thing that's really big in my process early on is sampling sounds um, because I I and it's, it's a part of it comes from like again just scratching that itch for me. Like I really enjoy getting to the point where I can make a relatively hi-fi. Uh, and faithful mock-up of what the piece might sound like and then listening to that in my own isolation and like trying to experience it and get joy out of it and then tweak it however I want mm -hmm. and so so one of the first things I, I always do is like make really good samples of the actual instruments that I'm going to be writing for and then finding ways to create some sort of a mock-up with those sounds um, so that's what that's very much what I did with that that piece especially the first movement um, and, you know, sort of like this weird combination of tempo maps and like harmonic scales that I found a piece somehow. <laughs> when you're when you're creating a tempo map, um, you there's a, a sense of polyrhythm, which is a yeah. texture in a certain sort of way, but it also is a form in another. Right. And I'm curious how you think of form when you are intentionally mixing elements from from different cultures so and hmm. not necessarily cultures but um like for example you know you're consciously choosing to um inhabit the gamelan world mm -hmm. including all of its uh, harmonic and overtone content but then there's a conscious uh, intrusion of the string quartet which has its own uh, overtone series its own um its own harmony in a way Obviously, those two things are relating to each other in the piece, but how do they um, how do they relate formally? Do you hmm. do you find that the string quartet kind of brings its own formal considerations into the piece, or hmm. are you more thinking of this in the context of a gamelan piece? Uh, I can yeah. The way that I just want to to answer just specifically about form, like if I were to if. <laughs> just to answer the question, what do I think about form? <laughs> How does form Don't apply to my work? Um, this is like a Qualls question. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, for, pick, for, your, for, pick your favorite. Yeah, yeah. For, for the Stanford University Qualls, the qualifying exams in the doctoral program, we would get only seven questions or something like that. Hmm. But each question had these long, unanswerable like qualities to it. It's like, compare rhythm between the Rite of Spring and Strauss's like entire output or something like that. What do you think about rhythm and what do you think about rhythm and Stravinsky yeah. and somebody else? And, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I don't think, I think that's a great question. I mean, well, I just, at least just the question about what 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 is form and how, how, how does one treat it as a composer? How do I treat it as a composer? Um, to me, that's, that's actually, that's usually the first place that I go. It's mm -hmm. like, how long is the piece going to be? How many movements is it going to be? If it's going to be in different movements or, or sections or whatever it is. Um, and then how are those sections structurally related? So, you know, I try to always start from the biggest place. Um, and, and, that, and I absolutely did that in that piece where I, I don't know at what point I had this concept that I wanted to do a piece that was like, it was just uh, water... It, there were two hydrogen movements and one oxygen movement <laughs> and that they would all be related like 
the first one would be 15 minutes, the next one would be 10 minutes, and the last one would be five minutes. And mm-hmm. I would have this nice 30 minute piece, right? Like that was step one, mm-hmm. <laughs> kind of. Um, and I and I thought about, um, you mentioned Stravinsky, um, just kind of an anecdote that was always running in my head that I heard once about Stravinsky that he maybe some, I don't know if all the time or one time he had this habit where he would put up staff paper like around the wall in his house, uh, you know, in a circle. And then, so that was like, that was the piece. And then he would go and write like the double bar line at the end. And that was the first thing you do is say, okay, finish the piece. <laughs> now I got to go back and fill in the details. Right? Here's the first note. Here's the last yeah. note. And now we got to go right. from there to there. Okay. So I, I absolutely work like that. I love working like that. Mm-hmm. You know, I hate working with what I might call like the headlight method where I'm just like, which is say is if I'm driving in a car and all I can see is the thing that's directly in front of me yeah. until I get to my destination. I, I, I almost never work like that mm-hmm. um, because it's just less fun for me, you know, because it might take me a long time to write a piece. I don't, you know, I want to on any given day be able to write the part of the piece that I feel like writing that day mm-hmm. and not be forced. It allows me to not get clogged up in the compositional process where I'm like, sure. I'm stuck on a certain idea and I can't get through until I get past it. Um, but uh, so the so back to the form. So the form of that piece was very much um, well. In a way, I didn't think about this at all when I was writing it. But after the fact, it kind of became apparent to me related to what you asked about Balinese music and how how might that relate? Because there is a very deep there are deep formal structures that are part of many many Balinese music compositions, and there is a sort of standard form for a lot of traditional pieces, which is sort of this tripartite form where you would have sort of an opening section that could end up being quite long, um, but it's often kind of faster and more involved. And then what's often a slow and quiet and expansive middle section, and then a fast last section Mm -hmm. and that's pretty much what i did with that piece actually Mm -hmm. it's just that the opening section 15 minutes long and it's very chaotic the middle section is very sparse and slow and sort of really looking at um unique sound combination between the strings and the gamelan and then the last section is short and fast and sort of jubilant or something um well there's even similarities there between yeah like classical forms yeah exactly sure absolutely Mm -hmm. um yeah it's almost sonata form Mm -hmm. you could say (laughs) you know um so uh yeah and maybe there's something about that form that works well or that you know that is attractive to go to as a composer or attractive to specifically not go to to go against um but but at at least i'll say that um, just looking at the big formal structures from the very beginning, it really helps me as a composer because I all of a sudden have a framework that I'm working in. And, uh, you know, so then I get to a certain part of a certain movement. Like I've already told myself the exact length that this is going to be. Mm-hmm. So now I need to compose that much music and no more and no less, mm-hmm. you know, um, and, and that that really helps me um, like in, in that in the. I keep talking about this opening movement. Maybe I should have played that for you guys. Uh, but the opening movement, um, it, it has, it, it, even though it's it is like its own fifteen minute thing. That that was that that's like the bird's eye view. It has its own form that is very um, very intentional. So it sort of starts, like I said, with these four tempo. Or sorry, it starts with one tempo stream that is just speeding up. So everyone's sort of following the same curve and they're doing these kind of like little polyrhythmic gimmicks around that tempo. And then at a very specific, like at the halfway the point of the piece, all of a sudden they break. Like as the, as the initial accelerando reaches its peak, essentially, they break into four. Mm-hmm. And then the rest of the piece is like coming back together and breaking back apart and coming back together. And one of the pieces that I was interested in at that time was um, Michael Gordon's Timber. Do you guys know that piece? Which one is that? Um, it's for a bunch of like planks of wood. Mm. Um, and I think it's a sextet. Um, it's the sort of thing I, they've done a bunch of performances of it. But I remember hearing maybe they did one performance of it like at a Lowe's. Uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just like, it's very, very, very appropriate. Yeah. 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 Um, but in they the had piece. a lot of wood there. You know? Yeah. There, so there's these, there are these. I'm not sure how the piece is designed. Um, I'm sure he could explain it in the depth. <laughs> but there are these moments where you hear these really just crazy sounding 
what sound like strobes, like rhythmic strobes, where you're hearing so so fine of a of a definition of of attack in between the six percussionists that then you hear these almost secondary rhythms emerging out of the fast mm. like combined polyrhythms. Is it, is it similar to um, Continuum by Ligeti? A, a little bit, yeah. But Continuum is um, like that happens i think less intentionally it's like when, when, i don't know it's hard, like so continuum I and mean, it's just two hands yeah. right and so it's even though you know when uh, the recordings i've heard of that piece is just like unbelievable what one person can do sure. on a harpsichord um but it's it's um yeah it, it is very similar yeah. i'd say it's very similar it's, but it seems like it's more it's almost more intentional in what michael gordon does and, and a little bit more audible audible because you know the 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 pitch material of continuum can sort of get in the way sometimes of if you're looking at the score and you see the direct mm. sort of strobing things that he is right. putting in there it's just it can sound kind of like noise when you're hearing it being played but since in in michael gordon's piece it's like the pitches are all very sim in other words the the pitch material and the harmonic material is limited it really spotlights the rhythmic material. Yeah, I think there's a Zanakis piece that does a similar thing to mm -hmm. Pladius, I think it is. Mm. Yeah, where you get this like articulated timbre or, or something like that. Sure. But there's like a, a specter that's there that kind of gets produced afterwards. Right. Yeah. Right, like this. And, you know, and another thing that makes me think about that is sort of Lamont Young, something like the Well Tuned Piano, where after listening to it for a while, what you're hearing is not so much the attack, but like this cloud of overtones. Yeah, you know, like yeah. this secondary listening that you get into. And so that, yeah, so that was definitely the thing, like the itch that I wanted to scratch mm -hmm. in writing that thing. Like, how can I, how can I create something like that using these sounds and mm -hmm, explore? Sure. Yeah. So uh, in this discussion of instrument building and your process, uh, how does this all relate to the piece that you've been uh, working on for the Other Minds Festival? Uh, so. It's that piece is very different than a lot of pieces I've written in the past, uh, but it does have one big thing in common, which is it's using instruments that I built, and that was the first thing that I did when uh, embarking on writing the piece. Um, and what's and the, the what's the name of the piece? It's called the pressure. That's right. So mm -hmm. the uh, the main the, yeah, essentially at that point I had um, I had built one kind of let's say full set of instruments um that was uh, what you heard in, the, in that other excerpt for for the jack quartet um and but that those instruments were using just a, a pentatonic scale a five-tone scale uh there's a lot of gamelan music balinese music that uses seven-tone instruments and that was a sound that i was more and more interested in um and i actually wrote a pretty long piece um, that was for uh, a seven tone, like sort of a small, a, a chamber gamelan using seven tone gamelan instruments and electric organ and electric guitar. It was a piece called Hamsa. And so I decided when I wanted to work on the pressure that I wanted to build a set of instruments that was similar in tuning to the instruments that I used for Hamsa, um, but co sort of expanded in in ways that that I thought would make the instruments a little bit more versatile, um, and also drawing from just certain things that I had picked up along the way and things I'd learned as an instrument builder. So, uh, so that set of instruments ended up being um, so. Well, I should say I I looked at uh, Lou Harrison's instruments, a particular set that has the name Old Granddad, and and I actually don't know if the set that I looked at was the original one that he built. Or a replica because there's several replicas of those instruments that have been made and there's some confusion as at least from what I've heard as to which one is the original but the one that I looked at is housed at UC Santa Cruz mm -hmm. um, he of course lived in Aptos uh, and so in any case I, I I had played on those instruments for a big festival of Harrison's music that uh, you know was done for the centennial of his birth which was two years ago and so, um, and then I had access to instruments being on the faculty of Santa Cruz. So I, I kind of studied them and took away certain things that I, that I thought worked well and, and other things that I wanted to do differently and built a set of instruments that um, the, the sort of the featured instruments, just from my mind, the, the most unique ones are these two big basses um, that are two octaves. And so they go essentially down to almost the lowest note of the cello, which when I say it like that, it doesn't sound that low 
because if you think about something like a double bass, you know, you don't you don't think of the cello being in the really low range. But when applied to metallophones, it is really low. Actually, mm -hmm. uh, it's much lower than a marimba goes, and it, in part because in order to amplify a, a standing wave that is that low, you need to have a really long resonator. Mm -hmm. uh, so it just the instruments look really big. Mm -hmm. They end up looking really big when they get down into that range. Mm -hmm. It's it's the range that like most gongs in a gamelan ensemble reside in. I so see. so it's an octave lower than what normally the lowest um, the lowest metallophones in a gamelan ensemble would be. In other words, the bases that I built are two octaves. The higher octave is what would normally be the lowest instrument in a gamelan ensemble, and then the lower octave is an octave below that. So like the gong range. Mm -hmm. um, and that was important to me because I, uh, in part because the xylophones that I had built in the previous set of instruments, uh, which are in the low range, they just never had enough power for me and for my ears. And so I, I you know, I, I started to just really desire and think about, you know, the type of sounds that I wanted to hear being much more like strong in the bass register. And the, uh, the fact of making one that was two octaves was just something new for, from from my perspective I, like Lou Harrison hadn't made those if you look at some of Harry Parch's low instruments they're usually only an octave and a half and one of the reasons for that is because in order to get enough volume or I should just say the um, the wider the bars are the louder they're gonna be right so and it's hard it's really hard to amplify really long waves so a lot of those instruments you sort of max out at 10 keys because uh, if they're more than that, they're just too wide to be played by one person. Mm -hmm. uh, but I essentially came up with a design that, and, and through a lot of trial and error, where I was able to create a two octave instrument that was essentially the length of a vibraphone uh, that could be played by one person and was loud, pretty mm -hmm. loud. Um, using so I, using um, aluminum bars and then aluminum resonators. Um, but the uh, so so I built sort of a, se a seven tone gamelan set around those bass instruments and I use various sort of Balinese tuning. So maybe I should say the reason I built two, and this is very unique to Balinese instruments, is that uh, Balinese gamelans always have paired instruments that are detuned slightly so that when you play unison pitches, they have this, they create this beating, uh, uh, yeah. this natural like difference tone beat, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that's a huge part of the soundscape of that music. And also just a sound that I find really attractive and it, and it opens up the door to doing some really interesting tuning things, um, which is to say sort of creating temperaments that work within the window of that beating. Um, so, so I built this, uh, yeah, what ended up being only six instruments um, that were all in that seven tone tuning, but they were all pretty versatile so that Sometimes they could be played by two or as many as four players if they people were playing on both sides of them, um, and then and then incorporating two vibraphones, um, and and that was that was big for me because I it, I sort of designed the soundscape so that the sound of a vibraphone would blend really well because a lot of the instruments are are aluminum just like a vibraphone, um, but. Uh, Vibraphones are, of course, twelve tone. So it was it was a natural way of not, as I had done before, we're taking something that's like it's in its own world, only five tones or whatever, and then incorporating twelve tone instruments and and like blending them, but having an instrumentation that from the beginning can be only seven tones, but can also incorporate twelve tone material in what what is ultimately the same soundscape, mm -hmm. you know, like the same timbre. Um, so that was sort of the that was the the baseline instrumentation that I set up uh, before writing the piece. And then the other big part of the piece uh, is it, it's all centered around a story that my brother wrote. Mm. And so it's extremely programmatic. Um, it's more like an oratorio or an opera in that way. Um, and that was something that, uh, so I had mentioned this piece that I wrote previous, uh, Hamsa, uh, that piece uh, was also based on in that case, it was sh several short stories that my brother had written, and they were um, related to the five pillars of Islam. So I, I wanted to kind of, I had this idea of creating a, a long sort of like post-minimalist gamelan piece that in which the soundscapes were sort of inspired by like, let's say, mosaic patterns, which is something that I've been really inspired by for a long time. Um, and then uh, and then the story is 
just through a complicated process of thinking of what we wanted to do, um, sort of were embedded in these mosaics. So the way that piece worked was the audience worked, was sort of reading along to the stories. Um, the stories were being whispered by multiple narrators. So the, the, the text was not intelligible. Uh, but then people would read along to them while hearing this like dense, mm-hmm. sort of minimalist music. Mm-hmm. Um, Is that like a, like a, almost like a different type of tempo stream in a way? Yeah. Like you have like the different speeds of the same text that are right. coming through. Yeah. Right. And it, so it's the sort of idea was that there'd be fragments of it popping out that you might catch. Uh, but then there's like a single stream of it that you're reading. And so sometimes it's like related to what you're hearing. Sometimes it's not. Um, and it, it was really it was more about the fact that I and this very much relates to the piece that I that I'm going to be premiering next week. Um, I have just a deep issue with text and music. And I always have like um, and I, I to explain that, I guess, even even as a kid, like I, I always like songs, but the, the but the idea of combining the message of lyrics with the emotional material of like the music was just always problematic for me. You know, mm-hmm. like I, I'd often I might learn all the words to a song, but never really think about what they were actually saying. You're preaching the choir here. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> we, yeah, we've had this conversation before. Like yeah. you know, just me and him, yeah. and it's very much the same sort of thing. It's sure. Like, uh, yeah, well, anyway, go, go. I mean, a funny, you know, example is that so, and a lot of people can probably relate to this, or you like, you can sing along to the, a song that you actually don't know the word, you're just like singing gibberish, yeah, and you still <laughs> might really like that song, you kind of you pick know? up a word here, like there, Pearl Jam or, yeah. or something. I loved Pearl Jam, I most of the time I had no idea what they were saying, and yeah, I didn't yeah. care. I think the like knowing what they're saying would have been more a distraction, or it became more a distraction when I learned about it. Well, there's also know? like, you know, let's say you really love a song, and then you you know, you look up the lyrics to it and you're like, oh my God, this is terrible. Right. <laughs> it's just awful lyrics. Yeah. And it's like, it's a rare thing where you look it up and you're like, okay, this is poetry. You know? Right. Yeah. It's, it's rare. Yeah. It happens. <laughs> but it I, still, I refer yeah. to that as the text music mismatch. Right. Right. Where the, the music is operating at a certain level and the text is perhaps mismatched. It's not right. the same impact. Sometimes and, it's the other way. And it's, I, I mean, I, I think it's one of the I, oldest... Yeah. It's like one of the oldest things that people have been hashing out in the history of creating performance art. Yeah, <laughs> you know, sure. it's like yeah. storytelling and music, and and they both are functioning on this linear time frame. You know, that has a start and an end. But often, the, the like the narrative things that they're conveying are just like so completely different mm-hmm. from one another. Um, so for me, when I was writing the piece Hamsa, like I knew early on, I do not want. Like, I, I want there to be these stories. They're a very important part of the piece, and I'm, I'm going to design all the music around the stories. But I don't want the message of the stories to co- have to be conveyed through the same mechanism that the music is being conveyed, which is, say, the ears. You know, like, that you're having to hear this text, make sense of it, and, and, then, and then hear this music and make sense of it, and somehow they're magically combining, you mm-hmm. know. Um, so that's why I ultimately settled on, well, what if they're being read? What if you're, it's like you're reading along to this thing, while hearing music, and then the voices right, are still read, read as in sorry. Um, narrated. So they or? were being projected live in real time. Mm-hmm. So the the text kind of like uh, super, super titles, super scripts, yeah. yeah. But it, it, instead of super titles, like there was a big screen, um, and they were it looked like tabloids of a newspaper or something. Mm-hmm. It was like the text was being filled in as mm-hmm. as as. Uh, anyways, so <laughs> so uh, and I I was really happy with that soundscape. That was what made me okay with the whole thing was I could listen to it and experience it and in sort of the way that I like to experience music but then I knew if I wanted to I could go into the text Mm -hmm. you know I could like pick it out of what was in there um and more importantly or not more importantly (laughs) along alongside of that concept was moments in the piece where the text was not activated so which is to say there were these there are five short stories in between each short story and its music was a long extended musical interlude that had no storytelling so so and my th- thinking was the, the the experience of this will go back and forth between sort of following this narrative that's functioning in language and then forgetting about it and just experiencing music and kind of being thrust in and out of these different modes of focus mm-hmm. um so that was this piece hamsa um and having you know sort of being happy about the way that piece um 
came about, I, I, my brother and I, and throughout the process, we had talked about, well, let's do something else. Um, and f- for that piece, the person who designed the video, that, the read-along video, was a, a, a South African video artist named Chris Bissett. And we, we had talked about earlier, well, what if, we, what if in the next project we make, actual, make a silent film? That he would produce a silent film, my brother would write the scenario, and then I would compose a score that would be performed along to the silent mm. film. Uh, so that was our initial concept, and that was what we applied for in the grant, and that other minds, um, you know, I, I approached them uh, because, it, you know, in part because I need an organization for the particular grant that I was trying to apply for, and, um, you know, Charles when he started listening to my music and, and read the concept, he was uh, thankfully very, very interested in it and we got the grant. But we immediately had to re- rewrite the whole grant concept because, you know, producing a silent film is just uh, extremely complicated and, and expensive. <laughs> um, so so um, just without going into all those details, what we ultimately, the concept we ultimately ended up on was... Um, Back to me narrating. So so having a narrator, but instead of it being abstract voices or something, like it would be my actual voice. Uh, and then there would be projections of illustrations that would be pre- projected at specific times to occur during the narration and during the music. So it, it still, I still sort of thought of it like kind of a read-along in a certain way, but instead of reading text, you're like looking at a, a graphic novel or something. Mm-hmm. So you're like being chaperone through this sequence of images that are sometimes conveying things very specific to what's happening in the story and sometimes like weird abstract images um and sort of and that that the minute that i we land on that concept i really started to have fun as a composer because i realized i can be very very intentional about, about the times in which things are happening so like i might all of a sudden there might be an image of a bottle of milk spilled on the ground and you don't know why. And then something in the text tells you why you're looking at that, Mm -hmm. you know? So just like really playing with time in that way that all of a sudden image is now like this very intentional thing on my, like the timeline that I'm working with, you know, like a film in that way. Um, but different than a film that it's like you're having to meditate on images for longer periods because it's just a still image that you get until you get to the next one. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh so so yeah getting back to the the kind of the whole process the form um the first thing was building the instruments the second thing was my brother writing the story um and just briefly i'll 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 sort of mention how that came about um so this is now like this was in the year after trump was elected when we when we premiered the previous piece hamsa it was actually like it was days after the government had come back from being shut down. And we were premiering at the Smithsonian. So that was pretty horrifying because mm. we had all these musicians oh flying God. across the country. We didn't wow. know if the show was even going to happen. That's terrible. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, it did happen. But it was and it was also all the more powerful because, you know, Trump had just been elected and here we are at the Smithsonian presenting a work that's all centered on the five pillars of Islam. You know, it just it felt like a, a really good thing to be doing at that time. Um, and... Uh, uh, so in any case, my brother, um, I think just, you know, thinking about the times, um, you know, we're both kind of film freaks. And uh, he was at the time really in, interested in early German silent films like of the Expressionist era. So mm. like The Cabin of Dr. Caligari. Sure. Um, Metropolis. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, and so I think something clicked in his mind where he was thinking, well, there's so many of these films are portraying these sort of charlatan, um, Svengali figures. And then that was the art that was happening right on the rise of fascism in Europe in the same period, you know, place where, where people were fixating on these sort of antiheroes. Yeah, yeah. That it seemed like a good time to maybe revisit that aesthetic and tell a tale about a similar sort of antihero. Mm-hmm. So, so the, the, just the pressure, is, the concept is um, there's this sort of traveling salesman who comes to town. And aspects of it are very directly sort of um, influenced by the cabinet of Dr. Cal- Caligari, if you're familiar with that, sure. um, where the, you know, the, the antagonist has a sidekick who, in this case, uh, the pressure, he's called the mute. Um, you know, in Cal- Caligari, it's the um, somnambulist or something. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, throughout the story, you, you, you start to learn that he's essentially... Uh, trying to sell sell plans to the people to resolve their problems and it's not clear whether or not he's the one who's 
creating the problems to begin with or making up the problems. So, so the, the main issue that culminates in the story is the problem of experiencing barometric pressure, like <laughs> the yeah. feeling of, you know, like tightness and ears sure. that want to pop and stuff like that. Um, and then ultimately selling them a way to alleviate the symptoms of the pressure. Um, and, and there are certain parts of the story that are, you know, trying to, trying to show the relationship to the fascism and, and even, let's say, to Trump, where, for example, the, the characters describe this having hair as gold as the silk of heaven spiders, <laughs> for example. That's one of the lines. So, um, you know, we tried to he tried to not be, I think, too over the top with it, but there was definitely an underlying influence. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you can't help but notice the similarities. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would say, um, you know, explaining it now, it sounds very clear. I think it's when you're watching and experiencing the piece, it doesn't necessarily come across as super obvious, mm -hmm. which is, I mean, I'm, I'm very much not supportive of like overtly political art most of the time. I, I just don't, to me, uh, at least from my perspective, I, I can't really get really, uh, get emotionally invested in something that seems to have uh, function on a different level of, of, of communication than like what I get out of art, which is like something that that's trying to, I don't know, um, enact change or I don't know. It's hard to explain, I guess. But so I, I, I'm glad that my brother came up with a story that had this underlying um, influence, but wasn't over. Um, so so that was, I guess, like that was the second phase of the project was sort of finalizing the story he, he had written it and then once I realized I was gonna be narrating it you know I did a bunch of edits to, to kind of put it in my own voice and then the third phase was uh, working with the illustrator um, and that happened over the course of about eight months where he was he would send me about two illustrations every day for eight months so the collection is is quite large and that was we had sort of come up with as the number that would be necessary to to, to present um, you know to present them in a 90 minute piece uh, so it's, it's a lot it's like 400 illustrations or something mm, like that wow. um, and so and I at that point I still hadn't written any of the music but I started to have more of an idea of what I was going to do when writing the music so I was able to give them specific instructions like I want a bottle of milk or something you know like very specific objects that I thought would be interested interesting to present at specific times throughout the story um and then yeah that was completed right around this time last year so last june and then at that point i, I started writing the music and it, it was it was pretty quick uh, i mean it just because i had lived with the story i had worked with the illustrations i had sort of thought about the timeline and the structure of it over such a long period of time that um it was just you know, and I had all of the sort of soundscapes that I thought I wanted to touch on compositionally, that it was just a matter of doing it, not, not thinking about it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and I probably watched like 150 horror films in the lead up to writing the music um, because it, uh, that was just, that was where I was at. That's where I thought, you know, all of the things I wanted to do compositionally was like how to get at certain cliches in the core of music horror music genre um, and sort of have fun with that as a composer and ultimately what I did was write a piece that's just totally schizophrenic so it's you know there's usually no section of it lasts for four or five minutes and you know it starts with an organ prelude that's really designed to sound like a baroque dirge um, that's you know very much in like almost a 16th 17th century style and then the next thing is this like jittery disclavier thing um and then you know there's sort of a sprech theme part with a singer singing in german and there's like a romantic string quartet scared so there's like all these different things that in my mind i sort of justified as being related to the horror music genre in a certain way uh, but really just allowed me to have lots of fun as a composer write a lot of different styles of music mm. um and and similar to the previous piece uh it goes there are musical interludes that are interjecting themselves throughout the story so uh, it, whereas in hamsa there were the different tales that were related to the five pillars in this case sort of the story takes place over the course of several days and at the end of each day there's a slide that says night and then there's an interlude that occurs that's supposed to be like weird stuff that's happening abstract stuff that's happening at night and you're seeing these kind of abstract slides mm -hmm. and then you get to the next day and then the narration comes back 
maybe there's one other thing I could mention about it that's kind of unique and related to what we were talking about a minute ago with uh, with respect to combining text and music. So, you know, I, I had that same issue coming into this project, um, but that was one of the reasons why I decided early on that I wanted to be the narrator because at least I would have control over how that was being presented. Um, and I decided that I wanted to synchronize my voice to a disc clavier so that my voice was not still not just like a, the naked voice exposed over like kind of film score music, but that there was this musical line that was occurring that's sort of coloring the words that I'm speaking. And then also just the presentation of that as being something like really uncanny to watch. There's seeing this person and this mechanical p piano that's like fully synchronized. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, I think, like a big novelty in this piece, the way that I essentially wrote for, yeah, it's just spoken word and then abstract sounds occurring on a disc clavier at, with the same like sort of rhythmic uh, mm. parameter of the spoken word. So it's not like an auto tune the news sort of thing. No, okay. no, it's yeah, because it's not. Well, I mean. I think there maybe will be aspects that, that will sound kind of like that, just in the in the sense of any time we hear something where it's like spoken word in a natural voice and then something that's just music and they're synchronized. It's just there's something happens in our brain that's like this mm. is weird, you know, um, but, you know, auto tune the news is is like very pitch specific. Exactly. And in this case, it's not. Um, I mean, there are sometimes I've gotten to the point where I know the disco repair so well that there are sometimes that I'm like intentionally sort of intoning my voice to follow it and sort of not. Um, and there's a lot of times where it's just like doing really weird stuff. Like, for example, there's this section where I decided that the disco beer was going to have a different triad for every part of speech. And so every time there's a noun, there's like an augmented chord sure. or something, you know, <laughs> and then just in different inversions and different registers. And that was how I made that part, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so just a, like a lot of, you know, just a lot of different ideas that are just thrown out there. Should we take a listen to some of it? Yeah, uh, sure. So I think maybe a good thing to share will be um, a part of the piece where you can hear sort of the fuller instrumentation where you get some of the metallophone, some of the string quartet, and you can hear me narrating synchronized the disco beer with uh, also background singers who are singing text in German. Mm -hmm.
So can you tell us a little bit about the excerpt that you just played and maybe how that fits into the whole piece? Yeah, so um, that was uh, kind of just, let's say, one scene that occurs near the end of the first half. Um, it's sort of portraying one of the characters uh, who is the undertaker's wife. Uh, and she's, you know, uh, has this sort of black magic thing that maybe she's involved with. And so I'm kind of, you know, I was using different harmonic language to, yeah, I guess, create an atmosphere that I was interested in, but also one that kind of mixed well with the tuning of the gamelan. So in that case, um, like the vibraphones are playing this kind of long cycle of chords that are built on these sort of messian-like modes of limited transposition. And then the other metallophones are doing like varying polyrhythms around that. Um, that's sort of the base of what's happening. Then I'm telling the story about the Undertaker's wife and the disco veer. Sort of its pits content is sometimes related, sometimes not related to what's happening in the other instruments. And then on top of all of that is the solo alto singer, and she's singing a poem that my brother also wrote. So um, I should mention part of that instrumentation is a quartet of singers, um, and they uh, kind of act like a Greek chorus throughout the piece, where they're they're not um, moving the the narrative along in terms of the story. Um, and they're singing in German, whereas the story's all in English. Uh, but they're sort of singing about things that are abstractly um, and sort of subliminally related to what's happening in the story. So, and those are all poems that my brother had written actually before, and some, I, maybe some were simultaneous or, or slightly after writing the story to the pressure that are oftentimes like almost Emily Dickinson-esque sort of rhymed poetry that uh, is often, you know, um, talking about the, the landscape of northern Michigan where the story is set and where, where he lives, um, various other things. And then I, I got them translated into German because I, I, wanted, I wanted the language of the Greek chorus, as it were, and the narrator to, to be different um, and to essentially like further abstract what's happening in the singers. So she's in that case, she's singing a poem sort of about coyotes. Meanwhile, that you learn at that moment that the undertaker's wife has sort of this weird coyote uh, re relationship with the coyotes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's a weird image of a coyote headdress and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Uh, switching gears a little bit, uh, I was curious: are are there other parallel compositional, or are there other practices parallel to your compositional practice? Yes. Well. Um, Definitely the instrument building is a big one, and I, it's parallel in the sense that, you know, it, it directly relates to the music that I write. Sure. Because, uh, you know, I, I get really into thinking about those sounds and how they function, how the technique of playing them functions. But also in, in that, um, I would say, maybe not parallel, but perpendicular. <laughs> in, that, in that, like, I go through times where I'm building instruments and then times when I'm composing and they're never simultaneous. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I almost mm -hmm. use the two to break up the monotony of the other. So mm -hmm. sure. I, maybe I don't use the two, but it, it functions that way. Um, where well, you get tired of one and you kind of right. have to go to another. Yeah. Because building instruments is just so different than writing music. <laughs> um, are, are you also building instruments that you have no intention of using in your own compositions? No, no. Okay, so it's always purposeful. It's always purpose. Yeah, it. it's always purposeful. Um, and it, it's extremely time consuming and um, tedious a lot of the times. You know, like I might spend three days crafting like tiny little pieces of wood in order to suspend some keys or something like that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a, it's, it's a task that I do really enjoy. I just I enjoy working with my hands. I enjoy the sort of like the architecture of it, I guess. Um, you know, making plans for the instruments, you know, being very precise about measurements. Um, and then, you know, when it, when it comes time to do the tedious work, you know, just getting into the, the manual labor of it, I guess. Mm. Um, there's just sort of like there's almost a meditative aspect to it for me um but it does by the time i'm done like by the time i was done building those instruments i was completely ready to not do that anymore <laughs> you know sure. well, now it's time to write some music yeah and yeah. then i write yeah. some music and then that's great and then i get really caught up and you know like 
questions about ego and uh, you know emotional hangups and all these things that come along with writing right. music. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, go back to filing some wood. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a really nice oscillation. Yeah, it's a little harder <laughs> to get caught up in like the emotion of. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I don't know, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> well, s speaking of these non-musical activities, um, how do you how do you introduce yourself to non-musicians? Yeah. And and how do you present what you do? Uh, that's changed, I think, over time. Um, like, I would say the question behind your question for me and you asking me it is, do you introduce yourself as a composer? Perhaps that's like a fair. question, that's a question fair. behind the, the question, yeah. um, which is which is which is a good question, um, because there's something there's something weird about introducing yourself as a composer, I think, or I have thought for a long time, in part because most people who aren't involved in music, especially contemporary music, like the the thing that I imagine they imagine when they hear the word composer is like a very specific thing that's very different than who I think of myself as, you know? Um, like it's it can be antiquated, it can, you know, yeah. it has a certain like um, sociological, hierarchical undertone to it. Um, and and so that was something that I felt very uncomfortable with for a long time. I, I, I never, yeah, wanted to, I would never have introduced myself as a composer until more recently. And I just, I think I just don't care so much about what people think anymore, which is why, and, I, and I'm, I'm embracing more the, the fact that I think of myself or I aspire to want that to be the thing that's the most important thing in my life and to not feel ashamed of it. Mm hmm that makes sense <laughs> okay interesting so uh well, so, it's relative to you as opposed to like how it how what other people might think of of like that word in relation to your music right you know? absolutely yeah i mean it's hard to um uh it's hard to explain even if i were to say to somebody who's not involved in music or the arts that i'm a composer um they that wouldn't necessarily answer their question like, no, I what? Mean, who are you? Or what do you do? You I mean, know? even if it was, like, even if it was us, right, right, you know, we, sure, we, we sure. We would have more questions. We obviously <laughs> have more right. questions. Yeah. Right. It's it's something that it just leads to a lot of confusion and more questions. But then that's why I'm always curious about sure. how other composers go about this because right. you do meet people, you know, out out in in the world who are non musicians, right, and that is one of the first things that is going to come up. Right. I would say, like, I more often... It depends on who I'm talking to, but I would... And for a long time, I would I would normally... If someone asked me what I do, I would say that I'm a musician before saying that I'm a composer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but that's also because I think for a long time, like I said, I didn't... Composition for me was often a way of, like, doing a certain thing that I wanted to do, like, you know scratch a certain itch from a sound that I wanted to hear or bring a group of people together or something. I didn't think of, like I should say, I, I had very little interest in writing music for projects that I wouldn't be involved in, like writing a piece for some commission for some group that would play at some place that I wouldn't have any interaction with other than sending them the piece. So in that way, I really didn't think of myself in a comp as a composer in that way. I thought, I think of myself more as like a person who produces pro art, art projects of which I write the music for. You know, um, but not not it's a very circuitous way of saying you're a composer. <laughs> sure, sure, <laughs> sure. But different in that, like, I feel like a lot of people who I know who do introduce themselves as a composer are are like actively trying to get a lot of commissions and write for things that that they are not necessarily involved with as the producer or like the ensemble director or something like that. Okay. Um, but I would say now I'm at a place where I'm I'm more. And maybe one of the reasons why I've started to introduce myself as a composer more is like I'm more willing to have that role because I've gotten really, I've gotten really tired of being an ensemble director and a producer and stuff like that. Like I've gotten to the point where I, I see the joy in just just writing the music and then sending it off and letting someone else deal with it. You know, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, let's let's talk a little bit about what your projects are coming up. Uh huh. Uh, so I assume that the pressure was very lar large scale over a long period of time. Yeah. Do you have some plans for the future for upcoming works? Um, I, w I think um, so. I, one thing I want to do is yeah, I've written a, a number of 
uh, I have about three or four pieces that I've written over the last as many years that are at minimum 30 minutes long and sometimes 90 minutes long that uh, that I was really happy with and got some really good performances out out of, but I never had the time to, to try to, you know, like get a professional recording done, like release an album, um, you know, set up more extensive touring. It's usually just like I finish a project, the premiere happens, and I'm immediately on to the next one. Mm-hmm. So I kind of want to go back and revisit some of those things and, and try to present them in a, a more intentional way. Um, but I also, after working on this project, I've I formed a desire to actually write for film, like to, to, to compose mm-hmm. film music, um, which is something that I was never interested in before. Um, Maybe for reason, the same reason why I think a lot of composers who I know, like in this scene out here on the West Coast, who are going to UC schools and PhD candidates and stuff like that, like kind of seeing it as a lesser, as sort of like just a gig, you know, like something to oh, something see. that's not as creatively rewarding mm-hmm. as, you know, writing, writing music. Well, it's like you, maybe producing a product. Rather yeah, than, yeah, sure. And, and of course, there's the trade off of control. Right. Like we're used to having all of the creative control. Sure. So. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I've, I just got to the point in writing the music for this piece where I saw how much fun and how inspiring it could be to sort of stitch a piece around a narrative and, 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 and be intentional about how uh, the piece related to image uh, mm. that I it's something that I would I would really like to do. Um, but I haven't made any inroads into starting to do it. <laughs> how about how about uh, text or um, dialogue in this in writing this way? writing dialogue? Well, I mean, in this, uh, let's say, mm. in a, a hypothetical film. Sure. Um, oh. It seems that image is something which you have in just based on what you just said. Like uh, aesthetically, you feel more comfortable with that in inclusion, including that yes. with music. But text is a bit more challenging. Yes. So is this would this film include some sort of dialogue or text? Do you think, or would you mean be... like the ideal film that someone's going to hire me to write music? Oh, I mean, kind just, of... uh, yeah. just kind of sure. you know, just imagining. Yeah. You know? um, no, that's a great question. I I mean, yeah, I don't. Um, like I, I should say, I would be, I would love to do a project that's just silent film, and. I'm writing music Mm -hmm. and that could be any sort of silent film, either one that has a narrative form or one that has a non-narrative form. Um, But I have a lot of things that I would, I would even like to do if I could be the one to produce something like that. Mm -hmm. I just, you know, don't have the experience of film editing. (laughs) Um, But, uh, but with respect to text, um, I guess, yeah, I've gotten more comfortable with narrative form. I'd say as as someone who has gone through a long period of training as like, let's say, a contemporary music composer, uh, I think it's it's not never explicitly stated, but it's very um, I feel like there's a lot of encouragement for people like us at at this moment to embrace not a narrative form. Yeah. Right. That there's sort of like Mm -hmm. that narrative form is maybe like cheesy or some sort of lesser um, achievement as a composer to move toward especially let's say anything where emotion like emotional content is explicitly embedded in the music that's being written like i in my time at mills and my time at uh, uc santa cruz maybe a little bit of bard but less so i i feel like i would have been gawked at if i ever yeah. brought in a piece where it was like my heart was on my sleeve or something yeah. like larry polanski would say well, what's the system, you know? <laughs> right? Yeah, well, there um, you go. There's the question. It's like it's this this odd um, reactionary hangover from, um, you know, music of like the 50s and 60s, let's say, that's hyper-controlled. That, right. Uh, aims to kind of completely negate all of the narrative structures and the right. emotional qualities of the... Composer as researcher. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's right. kind of an, exactly. an intentional yeah. way of distancing oneself, but those things have just been received at this point like right. it's not it's no longer even a reaction right. I mean in another sense bringing back the narrative is kind of yeah, yeah. imagine the, the natural progression forward yeah it's the zeitgeist mm-hmm. the cycle of it that's how I feel at least that's where I've gotten now as a composer mm-hmm. where it's like I've done a lot of music of music as composer as researcher um, and I've and I've enjoyed those projects a lot um, and I've but something about it it's like always 
I, I, it still sounds emotional to me when I listen to it, you know? Well, the way, um, that you described yeah. the, the way that you described your own process earlier on of how, how do you even, like, get yourself to kind of compose through the pieces? Like yeah. You play these things for yourself, and I think you said something like you're kind of uh, feeling the joy of it and, yeah. you know, making adjustments depending on what that is. That requires you to like feel something about the music that you're making, right. which is, I think, distinct from someone who I'm merely trying to um, explore exhaustively all of the options that come out of this particular set of things. Right. You know? sure. Yeah, the, the two are not mutually exclusive. Yeah, of absolutely. Course. And to be honest, that's one of the major uh, categories that I evaluate whenever hmm. I'm listening to music. Yeah. I say, okay... Is it interesting though? Sure. Like, is yeah. it speaking to me on an aesthetic level? Mm -hmm. See, I yeah, and I there's I feel like in the back of my mind, I still am trying to write a certain type of piece that is more non-narrative um, or narrative in a musical way that maybe like an abstract God, narrative. I, I want to like um, yeah, sure. But the, I guess what I'm trying to say is that there is some. And I, and I really fight against this feeling, but I feel like I have in the back of my mind that there's like some right form. Like there's this, let's call it like a time diamond. There's like a time <laughs> diamond out there that I just haven't found my way to like chisel into it yet. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm trying to get there, you know? Um, and that, you know, <laughs> something like, like, like a lot of people for hundreds of years have been hung up on box music mm -hmm. for those sort of properties. You know what yeah. I mean? Like it can, and to me, some of it has to do with, for example, like box music, which, um, you know, I'm assuming you guys have had your own relationships with over the years. And I've had my relationship with, um, there's, there's aspects of that music that, uh, I can revisit the same, forms over and over again and never get tired of right like there's and that's why that's why i use the word diamond where it's like it can withstand any amount of scrutiny or pressure that you're going to put on it right um the form like holds up um and with my own music i feel like maybe what i'm trying to achieve or the thing that i f feel like i failed at is when i get to a point with a piece where i've written it i've listened to it a bunch of times and then i ultimately get tired of it Right. Mm -hmm. And the pieces that I like more of the ones I've written are the ones that I don't that I can listen to more times, like sort of squeeze more out of before I get tired of it. But that theoretically there is like that piece out there that I will never get tired of. And it's just I haven't found that form yet. So that's like that's kind of the opposite of the question about narrative. I mean, now I'm getting into like absolutism and stuff like that, mm -hmm. which, of course, I'm coming at it from my own subjective standpoint. Um, but uh you know, that's to me, that piece will never be like a film score piece mm -hmm. or something. You know, well, it demands too much um, individual attention, maybe. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Or it's like it's for me with pieces that are m m very emotionally charged or con that convey some sort of emotional thing. It's like there's only so many times that you can revisit that same emotional timeline you know, before mm -hmm. you don't want to go there anymore or you've you've exhausted it. Whereas that's why I, I use the example of Bach, which is that that music can be more emotionally detached, even though it has a lot of emotional content. But that's what allows me to revisit a lot of that music many, many times is that I'm not forced to ex have the same experience every time. I'm like, I'm yeah. like seeing it from different angles sure. each time. Well, it's not necessarily cathartic is the is the point, I think. Yeah. Because like if if you have that experience and it was only meant to kind of exercise that from you yeah. and after it's out, you have, it's served its function. Right. If that was what its goal was. Sure. If its goal is something else, which includes that kind of emotional element as part of his, if it, as part of its aesthetic or, um, as a personal discovery that kind of came out by writing the piece, right. then, you know, theoretically, you know, you, you'd be able to listen to it from different perspectives each time. And, yes. Yeah. yeah. So narrative doesn't necessarily mean simple form. Yeah. You could have non nonlinear storytelling. And right. When you think of film narratives, there are plenty of examples of like yeah. very complex narratives. Right. Right. Yeah. Linear linear and narrative are. Well, I guess I'm I'm thinking of when I use the term narrative form. Um, it's hard to explain, but I. Yeah, I don't mean narrative in the sense of like the story or the the speech or the wording of it. I just, I, yeah, I guess I do mean linear. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I mean linear, 
like it has a starting point and end point where it's non-linear but it's linear and it's a story it's like yeah. well I mean this is such a hard thing to talk about because all music and all film is 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 occurs in time which is linear <laughs> you know so it's like but some music and some art is like but, meant to contemplate time from a different perspective that yeah. breaks up right. the linear it's, it's linear in the sense that we are experiencing a start and end yeah. that progresses at a constant run throughout time, but the story itself is jumping around sure, throughout yeah. other timelines. Something like a film like like Quentin Memento Tarantino or something. Or, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Kurosawa. You know. But even that, I would still like, to me, that's more of a linear or a narrative form than something like Buñuel or something where you're sort of, you're just like, you're broken. It's broken. You know what I mean? There's not like, there's not a, a takeaway at the oh, end. Oh, I see, I see. You know, that's like more modernist and abstract. Yeah. Does that make sense? Well, it's not necessarily about completing a story. It's right. more that there are like narrative elements that are presented in an abstract way. Right. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. yeah. something, And I feel like music can be that too, where, you know, let's say most of the genre of music written in the 19th century or romantic music is is very much in this narrative space, you know, where it's like, it's an experience that occurs it starts, it ends. There's certain points where you're, you, the composer intends that the listener feels a certain type of emotion or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, if you're looking at Feldman, like it, you know, it has all the same properties that it starts and ends. You experience things along the way, it's so but the type though. of experience that you take away is just categorically different in my mind and well, what he you, was intending. You can you even, know? you can even, I would even kind of call back the early influences on your own music with the the impressionist. Uh, sure. Piano works like those are immersive in a way that the others aren't necessarily right. Like they, yeah, yeah. They're a, a long, they're a, a larger chunk of a of a continuous experience right. as opposed to something which mm. is event based and iterative. Sure. And, yeah. yeah, It's setting a tone or an atmosphere that you're just inhabiting right. rather than guiding you through this storyline. Which is which is the way I feel about all, that Baroque music is closer to that. Than let's say romantic music, yeah, you know, like it's it's a it's a structure that you can enter and exit at will that has rules, mm. you know. It's not like an expression of the self so much. Might be a nice closing point. Sure. Actually. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much, Brian. No, thank you guys. Yeah, it was this great has to been have a pleasure. You. Yeah. Um, time. Lots. Cumber time. Over time. Over. That was our interview with Brian Bombush an American composer living in the Bay Area. More of his music is available at brianbombush.com. That's brian, B-A-U-M-B-U-S-C-H dot com. If you would like to hear more episodes, new interviews are broadcast on Composer Overtime's YouTube and SoundCloud. Zero. 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 Zero.